Uh, the first selection is from uh, Miami and the Siege of Chicago. And there's a description of the latter city. The reporter was sentimental about the town. Since he had grown up in Brooklyn, it took him no time to recognize, whenever he was in Chicago again, that the urbanites here were like the good people of Brooklyn. They were simple, strong, warm-spirited, sly, rough, compassionate, jostling, tricky, and extraordinarily good-natured because they had sex in their pockets, muscles on their back, hot eats around the corner, neighborhoods which dripped with the sauce of local legend and real city architecture, brownstones with different windows on every floor, vistas for miles of red brick and two-family wood frame houses with balconies and porches, runty, stunted trees rich as farmland and their promise of tenderness the first city evenings of spring, streets where kids played stickball and roller hockey, lots of smoke and iron twilight, the clangor of the late 19th century, the very hope of greed was in these streets. London 100 years ago could not have looked much better. Brooklyn, however, beautiful Brooklyn, grew beneath the skyscrapers of Manhattan so it never became a great city, merely an asphalt herbarium for talent destined to cross the river. Chicago did not have Manhattan to preempt top branches, so it grew up from the savory of its neighborhoods to some of the best high-rise architecture in the world. And because its people were Poles and Ukrainians and Czechs, as well as Irish and the rest, the city had Byzantine corners worthy of Prague or Moscow odd, tortured, attractive drawbridges over the Chicago River, huge Gothic spires like the skyscraper that held the Chicago Tribune, curves and abutments and balconies and cylindrical structures 30 stories high, twisting in and out of the curves of the river and fine balustrades in its parks. Chicago had a north side on Lakeshore Drive where the most elegant apartment buildings in the world could be found. Sutton Place in New York betrayed the cost analyst in the eye of the architect, next to these palaces of glass and charcoal-colored steel. In superb back streets behind the towers on the lake were brownstones which spoke of ironies, cupidities, and intricate ambition in the fists of the robber barons who commissioned them. Substantiality, hard work, heavy drinking, carnal meats of pleasure, and a Midwestern sense of how to arrive at upper-class decorum were also in the American grandeur of these few streets. If there was a fine American aristocracy of deportment, it was probably in the clean, tough, keen-eyed ladies of Chicago one saw on the streets off Lakeshore Drive on the near north side. Not here for a travelogue. No need then to detail the loop in death like the center of every other American city. But what a dying. Old department stores, old burlesque houses, avenues, dirty avenues. The L with its 19th century dialogue of iron screeching against iron around a turn and caverns of shadow on the pavement beneath. The grand hotels with their massive lobbies, baroque ceilings, resplendent as Roman bordellos. Names like Sheraton, Blackstone, Palmer House, red fields of carpet, a golden cage for elevator. The unheard crash of giant mills stamping new shapes on large and obdurate materials is always pounding in one's inner ear. Dreiser had not written about Chicago for nothing. To the west of the lake were factories and Cicero's, mafia lands and immigrant lands. To the north, the suburbs, the Evanstons. To the south were Negro ghettos of the south side. Belts of black men amplified each the resonance of the other's cause. The black belt had the Blackstone Rangers, the largest gang of juvenile delinquents on earth, 2,000 by some count. One could be certain the gang had leaders as large in potential as Hannibal or Attila the Hun. How else account for the strength and wit of a stud who would try to rise so high in the Blackstone Rangers? Further south and west were enclaves for the University of Chicago, more factories, more neighborhoods for Poles, 
some measure of more good hotels on the lake and endless neighborhoods. White neighborhoods which went for miles of ubiquitous dingy wood houses with backyards. Neighborhoods to hint of Eastern Europe, Ireland, Tennessee, a gathering of all the clans of the Midwest, the Indians and Scotch-Irish, Swedes, some Germans, Italians, Hungarians, Romanians, Finns, Slovaks, Slovenes. It was only the French who did not travel. In the Midwest, land spread out. Not five miles from the loop were areas as empty, deserted, enormous, and mournful by night as the outer freight yards of Omaha. Some industrial desert or marsh would lie low on the horizon, an area squalling by day, deserted by night, except for the hulking Midwestern names of the boxcars and the low sheds, the warehouse buildings, the wire fences that went along the side of unpaved roads for thousands of yards. The stockyards were like this. The famous stockyards of Chicago were at night as empty as the railroad sidings of the moon. Long before the Democratic Convention of 1968 came to the Chicago Amphitheater, indeed 18 years ago when the reporter had paid his only previous visit, the area was even then deserted at night, empty as the mud holes on a battlefield after a war has passed. West of the amphitheater, railroad sidings seem to continue on for miles, accompanied by those same massive low sheds, larger than armories, with pens for tens of thousands of frantic beasts, cattle, sheep and pigs, animals in an orgy of gorging and dropping and waiting and smelling blood. In the slaughterhouses during the day, a carnage worthy of the disasters of war took place each morning and afternoon. Endless files of animals were led through pens to be stunned on the head by hammers and then hind legs trussed, be hoisted up on hooks to hang head down and ride along head down on an overhead trolley which brought them to Negroes or whites, usually huge. The whites most often Polish or hunkies, hence the etymology of hunky, a Chicago word. The Negroes up from the south, huge men built for the shock of the work, slash of a knife on the neck of the beast, and gouts of blood to bathe their torso, stripped of necessity to the waist, and blood to splash their legs. The animals passed a psychic current back along the overhead trolley. Each cut throat released its scream of death into the throat not yet cut and just behind. And that penultimate throat would push the voltage up, drive the current back and further back into the screams of every animal upside down and hanging from that clanking overhead trolley. Bare electric bulbs screaming into the animal eye and brain, gurglings and awesome hollows of sound coming back from the open plumbing ahead of the cut jugular, as if death were indeed a rapids along some underground river. And the fear and absolute anguish of beasts dying upside down, further ahead, passed back along the line, back all the way to the corrals and the pens, back even to the siding with the animals still in boxcars, back, who knew, so high might be the psychic voltage of the beast, back to the farm where first they were pushed into the truck which would take them into the train. What an awful odor, the fear of absolute and unavoidable death gave to the stool and stuffing and pure vomitous stuff of the beast waiting in the pens in the stockyard. What a sweat of hell leather, and yet the odor, no, the tetanic stench which arose from the yards was not so simple as the collective diuretics of an hysterical army of beasts, no. For after the throats were cut and the blood ran in rich gutters, red light on the sweating back of the red throat cutters, the dying and some just dead animals clanked along the overhead, arterial blood spurting like the nip-ups of a little boy urinating in public. The red-hot carcass quickly encountered another black or hunky with a long knife on a long stick who would cut the belly from chest to groin and a stew and a stink of 200 pounds of stomach, lungs, intestines, mucosities, spleen, exploded cow flop and pig shit, blood, silver lining, liver, mother of pearl tissue and general gag all would flop and slither over the floor. The man with the knife getting a good blood splatting as he dug and twisted with his blade to liberate the roots of the organ, intestine and impedimenta still integrated into the meat and bone of the excavated existence he was working on. Well, the smell of the entrails and that agonized blood electrified by all the outer neons of ultimate fear got right into the grit of the stockyard stench. 
Let us pass over into the carving and the slicing, the boiling and scraping, the kneeling and curing of the flesh and sugars and honeys and smoke, the cooking of the cow carcass, stamp of the inspector, singeing of the hair, boiling of hooves, grinding a gristle, the wax papering and the packaging, the foiling and the canning, the burning of the residue, and the last slobber of the last unusable guts as it went into the stockyard furnace and up a stockyard smoke, burnt blood and burnt bone and burnt hair to add their properties of specific stench to fresh blood, fresh entrails, fresh fecalities already all over the air. It is the smell of the stockyards, all of it taken together. A smell so bad, one must go down to visit the killing of the animals or in conscience never eat meat again. Watching the animals be slaughtered, one knows the human case. No matter how close to angel we may come, the butcher is equally there. So be it. Chicago makes for hard minds. On any given night, the smell may go anywhere. Down to Gary to fight with the smog and the coke. Out to Cicero to quiet the gangs with their dreams of gung-ho and mop up. North to Evanston to remind the polite that inter Ficis et Uranam are we born, and east on out to Lake Michigan, where the super felicities and the stench of such earthbound miseries and corruptions might cheer the fish with the clean, spermy, deep waters of their fate. Yes, Chicago was a town where nobody could ever forget how the money was made. It was picked up from floors still slippery with blood, and if one did not protest and take a vow of vegetables, one knew at least that life was hard. Life was in the flesh and in the massacre of the flesh. One breathed the last agonies of beasts. So something of the entrails and the secret of the gut got into the faces of native Chicagoans. A great city, a strong city, with faces tough as leather hide and pavement. It was also a city where the faces took on the broad beastiness of ears which were dull enough to ignore the bleatings of the doomed. Noses battered enough to smell no more the stench of every unhappy end. Mouths, fat mouths or slit mouths, ready to taste the gravies, which were the reward of every massacre. And eyes, simple pig eyes, which could look the pig truth in the face. In any other city, they would have found technologies to silence the beasts with needles, quarter them with machines, lull them with Muzak, and have stainless steel for floors aluminum beds to take over the old overhead trolley. Animals would be given a shot of vitamin enrichment before they took the last rod. But in Chicago, they did, it, they did it straight. They cut the animals right out of their hearts, which is why it was the last of the great American cities. And people had great faces, carnal as blood, greedy, direct, too impatient for hypocrisy, in love with honest plunder. They were big and human and their brother in heaven was the slaughtered pig. They did not ignore him. If the yowls and moans of his extinction was the broth of their strength, still they had honest guts to smell him to the end. They did not flush the city with odorono or pinex or no scent. They swilled the beer and assigned the hits, and it gave America its last chance at straight out drama. Only a great city provides honest spectacle, for that is the salvation of the schizophrenic soul. Chicago may have beasts on the street. It may have a giant of fortitude for mayor who grew into a beast, a man with the very face of Chicago. But it is an honest town. It does not look to incubate psychotics along an air-conditioned corridor with a vinyl floor.